This is Aliens and Artists. I'm your host, Stuart Davis. The inception of this series is recounted in Episode Zero, titled Man Meets Mantis. That audio documentary relates my encounter with an eight-foot-tall mantis entity, unidentified craft cited by my family, and a wave of high strangeness and super-synchronicities that rippled through dozens of lives. If you haven't heard Man Meets Mantis, just go to the beginning of the podcast feed and you'll find it. It's also been shared on Coast to Coast with George Knapp, YouTube, and a variety of podcasts. That original face-to-face encounter took place on New Year's Eve of 2010. And although other anomalous events have occurred since then, I haven't felt particularly compelled to share them publicly. I primarily enjoy working one-on-one with other experiencers, or in groups through our new Experiencer Group membership site. Also, there's simply no end to the fascinating, moving accounts so many are sharing here on Aliens and Artists, and I'm enthralled hearing them each week on the show. However, I recently had an experience which, for me at least, teased open a few threads in the dimensional knot that is human contact with non-human intelligences. I was a bit more prepared this time around, since the 2010 Mantis event accentuated the odd and ephemeral opportunities that fevers afford. When one arrived this time around, I assumed the corpse pose and unspooled some silver cord from my soul, so to speak. It was a bit like a febrile bike I hadn't ridden in 11 years. I wobbled, to be sure. But the bike obliged as I careened into some weird shit, which I will now share. Next week, we will get back to our normal show structure with a guest and lots of deep goodness. For now, I hope you... (laughs) What? I don't even know. I just hope you. I hope you very much. (laughs) On to our update from the fever front. 12 hours after receiving the second dose of the Moderna vaccine, I acquired many of the typical responses. Fever, aches, chills, headache, ringing ears, and insomnia. The symptoms set in at midnight, just as Tuesday, May 4th became Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. I didn't sleep at all that night. I writhed, tossed, and turned. However, as the fever progressed, An interesting and difficult to explicate experience emerged. In fact, it was an experience I hadn't had since midnight on New Year's Eve 2010, which was the last time I had a fever. It was also the moment the eight-foot-tall mantis entity, adorned in purple robe with high collar, appeared and shot me, for lack of a better word, full of a download. But this fever on May 5th, 2021, went a decidedly different route. I began to have visions, or what I would normally consider dreams, except that I was not asleep. My insomnia was one of the more pronounced side effects, actually. What began to happen in that insomnia was that A. Time began to unravel and become non-linear. That itself is paradoxical, in a sense. What is time if it doesn't progress via a succession of moments? Nonetheless, parts of time began to fold, with some parts folding on to others and co-locating, so that two separate moments in time occupied the same address. B. Once occupying the same address, these distinct moments or temporal nodes communicated and interacted as though in conversation. Unlike past memories trapped in amber, these were dynamic. They weren't being recalled, they were still alive, and these moments were still active. They had converged from distant stations in order to converse, which they did. One of the parties present in the conversation was my last fever in 2010 when the mantis appeared. The highest intensity of communication among these various nodes in time were 1. 
the visions I was having in the present, two, the fever dream in 2010 with the mantis, and three, to some lesser degree, all my fever dreams from my youth, which were plentiful. Back to our A, B, and C facets, I also experienced how C, the mantis entity in the 2010 event, knew how to conduct or orchestrate the communication and dynamic among these various fever states throughout time. Via the fever, I was brought into the dynamic which is perhaps more the manted entity's normal or base reality, which is that these temporal nodes are all available simultaneously. So the mantid was involved in facilitating the conversation among these dreams across time as though all times were coextensive or simultaneously present and available. This definitely felt like another dimension, not normally available to me. As though the membrane between my usual dimensional menu expanded to include one more dimension, and time was super goofy there. I never totally went there, more like another party or dimension joined the conversation, and the fever somehow in part makes that possible. There were many, many events and facets of this. None of them were particularly profound or insightful. It was more the exotic or unusual nature of the whole flux that stood out. One example among dozens, which occurred in about a 24-hour period, is that I had the distinct impression I was visioning all about Vincent van Gogh, his life, his work, what it meant, what was really behind his mental illness, what his life signified in the tug-of-war between pure divine creativity and the artifice of commodifying artists' creativity. The next morning, I watched At Eternity's Gate, the film about Vincent van Gogh's life, and it was as though the entire movie was a bizarre replay of my previous day's visioning. Although I had no notion or intention of watching the movie the day before, it was just a random thing the next day that I chose it because I was sick and I wanted something mellow and quiet to have on in the background. But as it began to play, I was flooded with scenes and vast, intricate premonitions about the film which I had had the day before. The two temporal nodes had been overlaid, and they had conversed. It was not so much already done or completed in time, but that all times were always present in dynamic conversation. Also, it was clear to me that this is always the case, but that my normal non-fever mind filters out or excludes this dimensional dynamic. It collapses the many realms to a more manageable, digestible reality that is the shallow end of the pool. But consciousness and or time is a vast dimensional sea with a measurable depth and incomprehensible dynamics. In my fevers, I catch just a glimpse of these. Notably, this even continued after the fever broke. The first day after the fever, I was still experiencing 25% of everything to be deja vu plus. It's not just deja vu, it's more like experiencing time when it is no longer a succession of events, but that living totality, whose constituents are all in conversation. It's limitless, but expressed intimately in our personal lives. The other shape I experienced was how difficult it is to take anything from there, the extra-dimensional temporal flux, back to here, normal waking state reality. Dreams can do it sometimes, not even fever dreams, but lucid or simply deep dreams, meditation, perhaps some entheogens, but on the whole, it doesn't transpose well, because bringing anything from there 
to hear inevitably involves collapsing and compressing its fullness to a version of it that can be accommodated by this realm. We end up with a facsimile of a facsimile. But even that radically expands the frontier. As I write this, even this post is rife with this already, always, has happened quality. But paradoxically also alive and malleable. One last thought on the mantis being as part of the update from the 2010 event. Having entered and permeated my fever state in 2010, I feel the mantid also entered and permeated all my fever states in this life, or at least obtained conversational access to them. By allowing me to experience a glimpse of this taffy-like quality of time, I also possibly got a hint of what it feels and functions like for the mantis entity. I usually conceive of time as a line, past, present, future. However, I have only ever experienced the present. Even when there is precognition, the future is obtained in the present. That turns out to possibly be a common denominator between humans and mantids in regard to time. Our present is simply a hugely contracted version of their present. What is present to me? This second? A radius including the last 30 seconds and the next 30 seconds? This day? Well, to the mantid entity, the radius of the present is perhaps colossal from my perspective. For instance, in my case, the mantids now includes the event in 2010 when it made contact. It includes my childhood, my death. As to its own life, existence, my guess is it lives in a now that I couldn't comprehend unless my consciousness were configured differently. This is also why translating the signaling slash expressive systems and intentions of mantid entities or other non-human entities can be so vexing because we think of an experience story in a sequential manner. Look at our story structure. Our story structure as human beings varies a bit throughout time and across cultures, but generally consists of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. In these fever states, one sense I get is that's not how it works for mantid entities. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis is linear. Whatever story is founded on for mantids, it can't be distilled to such a formula. A better analogy for a mantid story might be a shaft of light refracted through a prism that erupts in a diaphanous rainbow display. I don't know just groping, but I also feel that at least the one I met is interested enough in us to also try to work with our story structure. It makes efforts to incorporate what it feels to be the signaling or theater that may somehow comport with human meaning. In the fever states, I would venture to say it also makes attempts to give me glimpses of its native realm, or at least someplace a bit closer to its neighborhood. I don't have any idea of how one would methodically cultivate this epistemology. Mantid fever dream divination or mantid mancy? <laughs> I guess you'd induce fevers over and over in order to open the channel. Doesn't seem like an advisable route to take. I haven't had a fever since 2010 on New Year's Eve. Perhaps the infrequency is part of what makes the opportunity strong when they do come along. I was plagued with fevers all throughout my youth, but I'm not sure I got more out of them when they happened all the time. Perhaps just in that the regularity of their arrival taught me to pay attention to them. Having just paid attention to one, I feel a renewed sense of their unique and important role in our liminal capacities. Attached in the show notes is a crude diagram of how two times converge in the fever and then add a third dimension which is the conversation and mutuality among the two times.
paintings for the temple. In the profusion of accounts in which artists have been inspired by non-human intelligences, Hilma of Klint's life stands out as unique and unusually moving. She was prolific to be sure, leaving behind well over a thousand large paintings and tens of thousands of sketches. But more importantly, the groundbreaking nature of her work and the odd, unshakable presence emanating from her paintings remains undiminished a century on. Let's not mince words. Clint gave birth to abstract art, and did so at the direction of non-human entities, known as the High Masters. And this was years before Kandinsky or Mondrian. Clint's legacy is her rightful claim as the mother of abstraction, but importantly, also as a singular medium, transposing visions from one realm to another. She was born in 1862 in Sweden. She attended the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, graduated with honors, and made a living selling landscapes and portraits. Although masterful, her early naturalistic works would be unrecognizable from the dizzying eruptions that were to come. Hilma had penetrating blue eyes. She was high-minded, kind, reserved, and described by many as resolute. She was a vegetarian and always wore black. But also, she was said to have a sense of humor. In her late teens, Clint began a lifelong involvement with various esoteric paths. These included Rosicrucianism, Rudolf Steiner's spirituality, and perhaps most pronounced, Theosophy. Hilma's sister died in 1880, and not long after that she formed what would in turns be known as the Friday Group, or simply, The Five. A gathering of five women who enlisted occult techniques in order to plumb other dimensions. They met with success, and by 1896 were in contact with the High Masters, a collection of discarnate spiritual leaders who went by the names Gregor, Clemens, Emiliel, Ananda, and Esther. Interestingly, the High Masters formed a numerical symmetry to their human counterparts in the Five. Clint and others were assiduous note-keepers. The details of their years of seances were faithfully catalogued. In the notes from a seance session dated September 16, 1903, this message from the High Masters was recorded. Quote, you are bewildered by what we have told you, but the phenomenon we are trying to explain is truly bewildering. What is this phenomenon, you ask? Well, beloved, it is the phenomenon of secret growing. End quote. It would be hard to overstate the impact the High Masters had on Hilma of Klint's art. It might be fair to say they became her art or at least that whatever it was which poured forth in these seances, which included precise directives from the High Masters, it came to eclipse all else in Clint's life and work. She would never marry. She did not seek fortune nor fame, in fact, seemed to avert and obstruct it, in order to preserve the sanctity of the artistic vision which increasingly spotlighted her in particular, from among the five who gathered on those Friday nights. Clint expanded her suite of mediumistic practices to include automatic writing, long before it would come to hold sway in broader spiritual and surrealist movements. Guided by the unseen forces, off Clint's hand would dutifully record the messages from beyond. She was surprised again and again by the outcome, and found herself at a loss to explain the phenomenon. As her occult path deepened, Clint's visual language shifted in tandem. She drifted away from the naturalism that had secured her income, and inexorably toward new symbols and signs that were abstract, vital, and entrancing. Their origin and meaning would leave many stupefied but would keep Clint enthralled for the rest of her life. It was no vague muse Clint had faithfully devoted herself to. She reported that the High Masters, specifically Ananda, had given her a clear imperative. Source your paintings from the astral plane. 
And she did. Off Clint drew exclusively from her mediumistic sessions with the High Masters, reflecting, quote, The pictures were painted directly through me, without any preliminary drawings and with great force. I had no idea what the paintings were supposed to depict. Nevertheless, I worked swiftly and surely, without changing a single brushstroke. End quote. Years into their weekly ritual of seance and mediumship, Clint received a decisive commission from Ananda of the High Masters. It is known as Paintings for the Temple. Clint never learned what the temple was, or where it was. Another dimension? Was it a temple which would one day be built on Earth? Without any such details, she nonetheless devoted herself to its realization. Paintings for the temple was executed in two major periods of intensive work. First, between 1906 and 1908, and then again between 1912 and 1915. The completed temple included 193 large paintings, structured in several series and sub-series. Clint described the process as divine dictation, and said, quote, I had no idea what they were supposed to depict. End quote. The works are huge, many with dimensions of 7.5 feet by 10.5 feet. In contrast, Off Clint herself was miniature, only 5 feet tall, which makes her massive scale works that much more impressive. When the temple was fully realized in 1915, Clint reported that the divine guidance from the High Masters halted entirely. This was, by any measure, a long-term relationship between Clint and the High Masters, yet they unceremoniously departed and never returned. Did this bother her? Did she ever feel abandoned, used? It's known she was not immune to depression. In 1908, she finished a painting every three days, until having completed 111 paintings, she collapsed from exhaustion. Another emotional nadir occurred when Rudolf Steiner arrived to view her paintings, only to inform her, quote, No one must see these for 50 years, end quote. How did this land for Hilma? We know she didn't paint for four years after that comment. She did paint again, though. Although after the temple, it was without her ethereal channels. The works were smaller in scale, although always exploring esoteric and metaphysical themes, the multidimensional nature of the human being, religion throughout history, with discernible anthroposophical and theosophical motifs. Clint was the OG progenitor of abstraction. Importantly, hers was an abstraction not stripped of meaning, but suffused with it. She was utterly devoted to the sacred, leaving behind over 1,200 paintings and 150 notebooks saturated with liminality. She seemed to siphon bits of Newman from beyond, leaving this realm adorned by another. Her final paintings were perhaps her most unsettling. They depicted the London Blitz and battle scenes from World War II, which was still years away. Family have noted that the gift of prophecy runs in the Clint blood. Her final journal entry of October 9, 1944 read, You have mystery service ahead, and will soon enough realize what is expected of you. End quote. Before she died in 1944 of injuries sustained in an automobile accident, she made it clear none of her work was to be shown for 20 years after her death. She died in poverty and obscurity. There's no indication that ever bothered her. After she died, the farmer who owned the property she had long worked on announced his plan to burn down the house and the studio off Clint had worked in. They contained her life's work. Only frantic efforts of loved ones emptied the studio in time. For years, over a thousand of off Clint's paintings were stored in an attic which had nothing but a tin roof. Boiling summers, freezing winters, it is truly astounding the paintings survived at all. When her work was unpacked in the late 60s, the public had never seen it. It was offered as a gift 
to the Moderna Musée in Stockholm, but astoundingly, they declined. Her work would go on to be exhibited at the Guggenheim, where over 170 paintings were displayed, as well as all over the world at numerous prestigious museums. Hilma expressed her wish for the 193 paintings of the temple to remain together. And they have. Today, Hilma of Klint's surviving works are managed by the Hilma of Klint Werk Foundation in Stockholm. Aliens and Artists is brought to you by The Liminal Muse, offering one-on-one work with me, Stuart Davis. Sessions include transpersonal hypnotherapy, contemplative practices, anomalous experience, creativity as a spiritual path, and more. Go to theliminalmuse.com to book a session, or just click the link in the show notes. Also, The Experiencer Group, a membership site for experiencers of anomalous phenomena from near-death, precognition, out-of-body, mediumship, abduction, lucid dreaming, contact with non-human entities, and more. The Experiencer Group offers global meetups, exclusive live sessions with luminary figures, in-person events, and much more. Go to theexperiencergroup.com to become a member or click the link in the show notes for a month free. The Experiencer Group. Supporting Positive Anomalous Culture. And, at last, at least, listen, I love you, but a lot of you make assumptions. You assume your financial support of aliens and artists is received by me, and then I, what, use it to buy food? Which feeds my daughters when they're hungry? (laughs) No, no, no pity, no. My daughters are nutritionally sustained buy the podcast. That's why I make it. They eat it. Dad, I'm starving. Oh, honey, here, have episode 51 with Leslie Kane. It's quite substantial. Dad, I feel faint. Do we have anything to to satiate your passion for anomalous experiences? Yes. Right here, honey. Episodes 14 and 15 with Jeremy Corbell. They're delectable. Dad, Please, honey, daddy is recording his weird stories now. So go stare into the distance like a good Dane. See, I don't use your money to buy food or pay bills or even make more episodes. I mean, these things magically appear each week. I would love to know how, but I don't want to jinx it. So what do I do with your kind, generous support when you become a plus member or when you become a patron? Why am I so damn eager to vacuum up those fat stacks of pod cash? Because I'm amassing wealth. Like a Bezos, like a Gates, like a Musk. But unlike Musk, who will squander his obscene horde to colonize Mars, I will use mine to destroy Musk's colony on Mars. I don't podcast, I plotcast. I'm waiting for Mr. Mars to pitch his tin tents in the red dust so I can just start unplugging this and snipping that and jiggling those. Do you know how affordable it is to sabotage an interplanetary homeless camp? So yes, your support is critical. Sure, when you become a Plus member, you get more than twice the content. You get insane bonuses. You support your favorite show. But you also safeguard the mad fuckery I've planned for Musk on Mars. Podcasting is simply the fastest way to accumulate incomprehensible amounts of liquid capital. Am I right, Joe Rogan? That's true. Now, if you'll excuse me, my daughters are famished for another episode of Life-Saving Entertainment.
Girl 